Okay. All right. So now that we're live streaming final, uh, finally, uh, welcome to Quantum Matter Seminars. Adrian cannot host today, so I will be hosting. Um, and today I'd like to introduce Emmanuel Gull from the University of Michigan, who will be giving us a talk on Nev Nevalina analytic continuation. Um, so yeah, just you know, the standard format applies. I think, is it okay if people interrupt you to ask questions during the talk? Definitely. Or I think it would actually be very useful to get that, you know, during the talk uh, while we're on the subject rather than afterwards. Of course, All afterwards. Right, so yeah, um, I think everybody should be able to unmute themselves. And let me double check that. But yeah, with that, go ahead and get started, Emmanuel. Thank you. All right, so thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about this uh, subject in this uh, condensed matter theory seminar. Um, you just saw what the uh, propaganda office of the University of Michigan does when they get a hold of work uh, from an undergrad student. And so what I'll try to do in this talk is present to you a new approach of doing analytic continuation based on uh, so-called Nemedlina theory. Uh, that's a very old mathematical theory that we've managed to explore. And really the main credit for, uh, let's see if that works, yeah. The main credit for developing most of it goes to my undergraduate student, Jenny Fay. Uh, you see her here on the left and the application to real materials uh, calculations, and I'll show you some of this, uh, are due to my student, uh, Jan Anye, that you see here on the right. Now, most of the work is published in this PRL and in a, in a FISRFP that I'll mention uh, later. And if you're actually interested, the slides for a very similar talk are up at this URL and you should be able to uh, just click this or copy paste uh, and, and have a look at uh, this in a little bit more detail. Um, all right, so what is this talk about? Um, basically it's about analytic continuation and the methods and common challenges that we have uh, in that field. I'll then, um, switch gear and talk, gears and talk about mathematics. In particular, I'll talk about nevin lenna theory, which is not a branch of mathematics that uh, physicists are commonly familiar with. And I'll then try to make the connection between the mathematics of 1917 and the spectroscopy of today. I'll introduce a couple of concepts that turn out to be really useful. For example, pick matrices, Humburger moment theory, uh, the so-called Carey-Theodori generalizations, and then I'll show you a little bit why you should care by presenting results for model systems, then GW calculation on the imaginary uh, axis, and finally, give you a little bit of outlooks and uh, future prospects. I'm not actually going to do that much physics in this talk, and I'm not actually going to do uh, real-world applications of these things. More uh, than that, I'd like to present you this methodology and a little bit the, the connection between, you know, pure math and um, spectroscopy. And so for that, I would like to revisit the problem of analytic. Oh, Greg, go ahead. I think you're muted. Or at least you're not arriving over here. Um, Let's see. So all right. Uh, hopefully you can unmute yourself. Try again, Greg. I, I'm not getting anything. Oh, let me see. Um, maybe it's an accidental? Well, oh, there's something in a chat. Oh, it's not allowing him to unmute. I'm trying to see. So OK, um, I think, uh, yeah, you did something. Uh, Philip, thank okay, you. Good. Right. So yeah, Emmanuel, hi. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you. I wanted to ask just kind of a motivational question at the beginning here. So it sounds like it's going to be kind of basically a math talk. I was curious. I will apply math maybe. <laughs> but um, what led you down the, this route? You know, those math terms that you mentioned, they're unfamiliar to me. I haven't heard of them. It sounds like you've kind of drawn on this like math from 1917 or whenever. Uh, yeah. Can you say a little bit about the motivation for... So, so why would a physicist here and <laughs> ever go there? And um, can, can, can you give me two slides? And sure, then sure. I'll, I'll say a little bit more. And, and maybe towards the end, I'll, I'll actually, you know, say much more than that. But that, that's actually a very good point. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I can just hold on then when it's a convenient uh, time. All right, I, I'm I'm gonna get back to that in just a slide or two. Okay. All right. Thanks. So so but but I'd like to you know line up the the topic in in a way that the physicists understand it. Um, let's look at something like a partition function here defined as trace of the exponential of minus beta times uh, a Hamiltonian. And what we really care about are observables such as Green's functions here written down in imaginary time and here as in Fourier transform into frequency. Now, if you've paid attention in your grad condensed matter course, you know that uh, this Green's function, the Matsubara Green's function on the imaginary axis corresponds to the uh, uh, spectral function after an analytic continuation. Basically, if you know the Green's function over here, you can from it infer uh, what, for example, an ARPIS experiment would find in uh, spectroscopy. So um, technically or mathematically, that relation is given by this expression over here, where on the left, we have the known computed values, the G of I omega n's, the Matsubara values. And on the right, we have the imaginary part of the Green's function, which directly corresponds to the spectral function of the factor of minus one over pi. Uh, you can write the same uh, formulation down as a imaginary time Green's function expression. But operationally, the problem really is that you have a Matsubara Green's function known over here. You have a kernel, which essentially is the discretized version of this uh, expression over here that is multiplied with what you care about. So you really would like to invert that kernel equation so that you have uh, an expression for the spectral function over here. Unfortunately, that inversion is very badly conditioned meaning that small changes on the imaginary axis cause large changes on the real axis. Um, let me illustrate this uh, with, with some almost historic data that I have over here. On the left, you see three spectral functions that you know, by just looking at it, look very, very different. On the right, you see the corresponding imaginary time, or in this case, Matsubara frequency Green's functions uh, as computed. And you can see that even though these look very, very similar on the Matsubara axis, they're actually very, very different here on the real axis. So in other words, the uh, continuation from this side to that side is easy. The continuation from that side over to that side is hard. And of course, this is where we perform all of our calculation in finite temperature field theory, whereas that over here is where we actually have our uh, results or where we'd like to compare and, and present our results. Um, so how do you do that uh, inversion? Well, the first uh, approach to it is you just simply do uh, an interpolation of your data and then an extrapolation to the real axis. You could think of doing a polynomial interpolation of your data, that's never stable, uh, but you could instead do a Pate interpolant and for example, find a rational polynomial that uh, satisfies certain mathematical constraints, like for example, has a bright high frequency dk, which in the case of Green's function is just simply given by one over omega. And in addition, hits all of the input points that you might have on the Matsubara axis, you see them over here. And that often works very well for quantities at low temperature or near zero frequency, uh, but it doesn't really respect any of the analytic properties of the Green's functions and more on that later. The resulting spectral functions don't satisfy any of the moment information. And the moment you get a little bit farther away from your interpolation points, like in particular up to higher frequencies, these things tend to go wild. They become negative, they oscillate, they violate the moments. And so basically this is a technique that sort of works as long as you're staying very close to your Matsubara points, but it's generally useless for higher frequency data. And in particular, it's never to be used with noisy data. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, too. The second algorithm that you can try and use for getting real frequency information out of a Matsubara data is that you uh, try to sort of interpolate almost in a you know, free energy sense between a precise interpolation of your actual data, here the minimization of a chi-square term, and an entropy term that is used to overall smooth your function. Uh, you know, in this case, it penalizes deviations from a default model that is very smooth. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and in this case, tries to sort of trade off uh, the precise interpolation with you know, sort of the smoothness criterion that this provides. And that's a method that is uh, very powerful in the case of noisy data. It does have its limitation. And in particular, one of the things that it does is it smoothes out any sort of sharp features. 
Um, there's also, you know, sort of unappealing things like there's this parameter alpha in here that if you think of this expression as a free energy expression, that's sort of the balance term that temperature has between entropy and uh, energy. Uh, that alpha, there's no a priori knowledge how to choose it. There's some operational recipes, but uh, it, it's sort of very um, ambiguous and, and very unsatisfactory from a theoretical point how you would actually choose these things. And so those are two very well established, very old methods that one can use for looking at analytic continuation. Um, basically, uh, when you're doing this in practice, you have to be careful. Um, the fact that both of these methods are running into you know, big trouble uh, is really a sign of the ill-conditioned uh, nature of this analytic continuation. I just showed you sort of how bad it is. It's an intrinsic problem that you're running into whenever you work on finite temperature grains functions. Basically, the higher the frequency, meaning the farther away you go from your known Matsubara data, that is at zero frequency offset on the imaging axis, the less reliable uh, your data become. Um, Maxent especially is sort of okay for integrals over wide areas, but certainly not for detailed features. So whenever you look at you know, spectroscopy data out of one of those algorithms, you can basically trust the first peak or the first gap, nothing behind it. Uh, if you see an evolution of a feature as a function of, let's say, pressure or temperature or other control parameters, those are usually robust. But if you just have a single simulation where you're trying to analyze a feature, you've got to be very careful. Uh, when you're looking at sharp features, you can always make these features a little bit sharper, a little bit higher, or you can broaden them a little bit and create a little bit of gap edge or foot uh, versus peak height. Those are just limitations where this type of uh, Matsubara interpolation is just not very good. And then there are all sorts of other pitfalls. For example, you have to be very careful with bosonic functions uh, where these are additionally less reliable. And, and basically, if you see that uh, different types of analytic continuations give you different results, that's usually a sign that you have to be very, very careful with interpreting your um, results. Now, I want to go back a little bit to, to the question that Greg asked here. And that is, you know, why the heck did we come up with, uh, you know, revisiting uh, essentially the complex analysis of the early 20th century. And so when we came to this problem, uh, we had a lot of experience in our group with quantum Monte Carlo data that came out of you know, finite temperature um, simulations. We also had new data coming in. Um, the new data was done with uh, semi-analytic perturbation methods. So for example, GW or second order perturbation theory, that was data for solids done on the imaginary axis and we would like to have, uh, we wanted to get, have then um, real axis results for that. And I'm not going to go and present that aspect of my, of my work in, in much detail because Dominica Skid just gave one of your colloquia, uh, you know, two or three weeks ago. What was new with our data is that our data was very precise. We could see that uh, our data also had information at very large energy scales. So on one hand, we had temperature information on the millikelvin scale. On the other hand, we had many, many e volts of the bare Hamiltonian in that calculation. And basically, we were then looking at our uh, analytically continued data. And we could see that the maximum entropy method, which was our preferred method to continue these data, lost most of the uh, information. The data that we had close to the Fermi surface was sometimes sort of fine, maybe. But anything that had to do with higher excitations, higher bands, or anything like that was completely washed out and essentially useless. So we had a look at what other people were doing. And uh, we found that, in general, there's a whole bunch of dirty tricks that are being used in order to get appealing band structures out of many body calculations on the Matsubara axis. Uh, the simplest one was to just simply kick out all of the dynamical self-energy and just work on the level of the Hartree term or a Hartree fork. Uh, uh, or the interacting fork matrix. In that case, you get you know nice spaghetti band structures, but of course you know you kicked out all of your dynamical self energy, and many times you know having that term is the reason why we're doing uh, finite temperature field theory in the first place. Uh, you see that you know one might want to downfall to a model system, limit oneself to a very small number of orbitals, and then you know run maxent on the model subspace that gets rid of the energy scale problem. 
but it doesn't really get rid of the fundamental problem that you know all of your features are being smoothed out and uh, and generally lost. And then there's a whole bunch of other dirty tricks that I just don't want to get into. But basically, the status when we started thinking about this was that you could do very nice calculation on the imaginary axis, but by the time you wanted to continue these things onto the real axis, all bets were off, and essentially uh, you had an uncontrolled approximation that you could just couldn't really work with. To illustrate how bad it was, I show you here the band structure of silicon. Um, this here is a high symmetry path in K space. This here is really what you would get out of DFT in a spaghetti spectrum. And uh, basically you can see that silicon has an indirect band gap, gap somewhere between the gamma point and well, somewhere here be between gamma and X. There's probably a bunch of bands. You see one dispersing over here, but the higher energy band structure, the way that you would notice from let's say DFT or a method like that, it's just simply not contained in that continuation um, anymore. And I'll revisit this prompt uh, in a bit. So we came at this and we revisited this and basically it was the middle of the pandemic or just before the pandemic. And, and one of my uh, students in my um, grad and matter lecture wanted to have something to do over the pandemic and essentially asked me, hey, you know, is there something that uh, we could go and look at? And so at that point, I was of the opinion that uh, Maxent was just not the right way forward. And one should go in, back and revisit the Pade interpolants. Because in the Pade interpolants, you have all of these nasty uh, deficiencies that you, know, you violate the moments and uh, things become a causal. But I thought that maybe by understanding the complex analysis of Pade approximate, a a approximates a little bit better, one may be able to fix that and you know, go back and revisit this problem and perhaps construct but a interpolants that are guaranteed to not have poles anywhere in the upper half plane. So let me go back and, and visit, revisit that problem. Essentially, this is how this was the, the original question, right? Can we make Pade not have poles in the upper half planes? So um, let me explain that pole business a little bit more. Let's look here at the Green's function in the Lehman representation, you see it written down here as, uh, well, as sum over differences of eigenstates. This Z here is either just above the real axis or on the Matsubara axis. And if we look at this expression a little bit closer and look at the thing in the summation, we see a one over Z, Z is a positive number, a square of a matrix element, and a sum of two exponential functions. So certainly that uh, component is uh, greater than zero. If we now set z equals x plus i y, and we look at y bigger than zero, so anything in the upper half of the complex plane, then this expression over here, which is just this you know, fractional expression here, tells you that the imaginary part uh, of that function has to be strictly negative anywhere in the upper half of the complex plane. So Green's functions are functions that don't just have no poles in the upper half plane. It's actually much more strict than that. Green's function have an imaginary part that has to be strictly negative anywhere on the upper half of the complex plane. All right, so turns out that functions like these are actually well known in mathematics or were, were well known in mathematics. Uh, on the right here, you see Rolf Neumann-Glinna who was a mathematician who was mainly active in the earlier part of the 20th century. And uh, the name the, the functions that have a positive real part in the upper half of the complex plane are so-called Neumann-Glinna functions. Um, so Neumann-Glinna actually we did a whole bunch of complex analysis uh, on functions of that type, but you know we figured out that the functions that we were talking about, these Green's functions, are actually of a well-known structure, and that's the structure of Neumann-Linna functions. Uh, Neumann-Linna functions are very closely related to a different type of mathematical object, uh, and th these are so-called contractive functions or Schuer functions. And in order to see the relation between the Neumann-Linna functions and the Schur functions, basically what you do is you apply a Möbius transform that maps the upper half of the complex plane onto the unit disk. You see the unit disk in here so that the real axis, 
becomes the unit circle or the boundary of the unit disk over here. With an additional mapping, the uh, neverland lena functions can then be mapped onto contractive functions. These are functions that have an absolute value smaller than one anywhere on the unit disk. Now, sure showed us that every contractive uh, function has a continued fraction expansion. And given a set of points on the unit disk that this uh, contractive function has to go through, sure gave us a recursive algorithm that can produce that, uh, um, that can produce that interpolant that goes through all of these points. And so basically what Nemelina analytic continuation is, is just a set of input Matsubara points mapped via a Möbius transform and the contractive mapping onto a sure function, uh, sure function in a unit disk, and then concatenated with a sure interpolation algorithm into a continued function expansion that is now guaranteed to have only a negative imagining part anywhere on the upper half uh, of the complex plane. And with that, it is guaranteed to be intrinsically causal. All of the poles have to be in the lower half of the complex plane or outside of the unit circle, if we're talking about this in the notion of offshore uh, methods. And basically, Greg, you ask, you know, how do you come up with all of this mathematics? That was our first step. We started with PDE and we wanted to make PDE behave. And we figured out that the PDE function, uh, functions that we were looking for are actually much more restricted. Those are the Nevernerna functions, which in turn turn out to be, you know, sure functions after mapping. I, I don't know if that uh, answers at least your, you know, your, your question about the motivation for looking into this mathematics. Okay, so um, let me then say a little bit more about sure. Uh, you see, is I sure over here? Uh, back in you know the 1917 or 1918, sure was uh, working on um, continued fractions or, or, or Taylor series essentially that are um, uh, beschränkt, um, they're, they're finite in the interior of the unit circle. And so basically, he said that if you give me a set of point in the points in the unit disk. I can construct recursively for you an interpolant that is contractive and goes through all of the points that you are supplying to me. Basically, we start with one point, we put a continued fraction uh, through that, and now I cannot just get a function, but I can get all possible functions that go through that point in terms of a free neman or sure function, which I'll use to make it go through a second point, which then gives me all possible functions that go through two points, in terms of a free neven lena function, which I used to make it go through three points and four points and so on. So you see the picture. By the end of the day, we have 50 Matsubara points or something like that. We make our interpolant go through those 50 points and we get a freedom in terms of a free neven lena function that now characterizes all possible functions that can go through those uh, predetermined points. There's a very important corollary to this, which also comes you know, from 1917, which has to do with uh, Georg Pick. You see him up here on the right. He was also a, uh, an Austrian mathematician working on complex analysis in the early part of the 20th century. Um, he said that uh, not all points that you can supply to me will have a positive uh, causal Neven-Lena function that goes through them. Um, but if you want to know whether there exists a Neven-Lena function for a given set of points, then all you need to do is build up this matrix. This is the so-called pick matrix and compute its eigenvalues. And if there is even a single eigenvalue of that matrix that goes negative, then there does not exist an interpolant that goes through all of my input points. And you can see that this is a very simple matrix to build. What I have here is one minus Matsubara value at point I times Matsubara value at point J complex conjugate divided by one minus Matsubara point I times Matsubara point J complex conjugate. And so this is actually something that is very useful and very easy for a practitioner like me. If I have a set of Matsubara points, I can very easily evaluate whether there even can be a causal interpolant that goes through my points uh, or whether that's uh, not possible. 
Um, so it's a straightforward text, uh, test that we can do in practice. And there's a very interesting observation that comes right along with it. And that is when we have data from any sort of Monte Carlo calculation, the pick criterion is never satisfied. Basically, even the tiniest little bit of Monte Carlo noise throws the interpolation out of the uh, domain of causal interpolants. Um, if we have synthetic benchmark data, like very high precision diagonalizations from a model systems, we can see that we always satisfy the pick criterion. And if we have semi-analytic data, for example, imaginary time GW or RPA data, that uh, you know is sort of accurate, you know, converged to ten to the minus eight, ten to the minus nine. Then we can see that within noise, we do satisfy the pick criterion, but you know things are very very dicey. All right. So there's two ways of, of thinking about this. That, uh, one way is that you know that just shows you that there are very few um, interpolants that actually you know that are that are legal, or there, there are many more functions that you can come up with than causal functions that actually satisfy the analytic properties of the Green's functions. The other way of thinking about this is much more, you know, turning this into a positive. And that is that the space of functions that are causal, legal causal uh, functions is so small that restricting ourselves to that space of functions will give us much, much better analytic continuations. And using the very constrained nature of this function space in order to construct interpolants will give us much higher precision. And that's sort of the route that we're, we're going to go there. Um, Greg, back to you. You know, how do you come up with this stuff? Um, basically, we went back to the 1917 literature, and we, you know, we did. And we went to uh, the old German papers. And fortunately, I still still speak a little bit of German. We read those papers. We saw who used these things afterwards. Um, you know, basically, the field died in 1945. Um, there's still quite a bit of stuff out there, and there's a sort of a, a lot of um, technique that actually turns out to be just ideally, uh, you know, positive for, for the types of uh, calculations that we're trying to do here. Um, and I see there's a question here. Yeah. Uh, so would it be it? Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay, would it be possible to define a basis to measure QMC data and that ensures this uh, pick matrix is positive 70 decimal. So meaning, I guess the idea is that um, make it so that the noise yeah. somehow uh, is not. Um, so, so that is an extremely interesting question. And um, I'll give you a partial answer in a couple of slides, and then I'll give you a full answer, you know, later. Um, that there, you know, there, there, there are two ways of doing this. Uh, one is to actually just measure in a causal basis that guarantees this, caus this causality. The other way would be to just measure and then project onto a causal subspace. And both of these are topics that we're looking into at, at the moment. Um, but, but as you mentioned, you know, QM QMC is the big elephant in the room here. It's really what we set out to do for, for some of this, and we don't have a final answer for it yet. But I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, anyway. So, so we went back and forth the old literature and we figured out that nevin lina theory was actually used again in control theory. And you know, that came up by uh, Alan Tannenbaum in the 1980s. He's a professor at Stony Brook where they were looking at control theory. So the basic goal is that you would like to have you know, some sort of circuit describing a factory or something like that, where any sort of perturbation that you put into your factory will decay as a function of time. So, you know, basically so that your pipes don't blow up. And uh, what that translates to in the complex analysis uh, framework is that all of the poles that you have in your response functions have to be on the left half of the complex plane. And so up to a Mobius transform that just rotates everything uh, to the lower half of the complex plane, that's a very uh, closely related uh, problem. So there, there's some connections to that that we then explored and that came up with some of the additional mathematics um, here. Anyway, I, I wanna go on a, a, a little bit um, and, and introduce you to the Hamburger moment problem. Um, the Hamburger moment problem, you see Hans Ludwig Ham Hamburger here on the right, um, is actually a, a, a very closely related problem to the Schur problem. And Hamburger was interested in integrals over the boundary of the unit circle. And his question was, 
that if you have not just specified a bunch of points in the interior of the unit circle, but also integrals over polynomials on the unit circle itself, can you now combine an interpolant that goes through these points and has the right moments on, on the unit circle? Now to translate this into a field theory context, uh, remember the uh, boundary of the unit disk, the unit circle gets mapped onto the real axis. And basically this is the question about enforcing moments of the spectral function. And moments of the spectral function is often something that we have very clear access to. They come straight out of commutators uh, of the um, Hamiltonian with our operators or uh, creation and annihilation operators. So it's often something that's just naturally available. For example, we know that the uh, overall normalization of the Green's function is simply one, or sorry, I should say of the spectral function is simply one. Uh, then the next highest moment has something to do with the density and then the one after that has to do with something with the uh, double occupancy, blah, blah, blah. So uh, these are objects that we know going into and Hamburger established now, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, functions that have these moments and neman linear functions, and that you can actually plug in the interpolation uh, algorithm that you have for the Schur function and combine it with an interpolation algorithm that now also enforces the proper normalization on the unit disk or on the, sorry, on the unit circle or on the real axis. And that gives you a natural way of combining moment or in, in physics terms, short term time uh, knowledge with you know, all of this uh, interpolation uh, stuff where you're mainly getting low frequency parts uh, exactly. Now, um, last uh, little bit of detail before I go into uh, results is uh, what we call the Hardy function optimization. Um, and for that, remember that a positive pick matrix guarantees an infinite number of solutions. Only if your pick matrix is positive semi-definite, so, or, or sorry, it has an eigenvalue of zero, uh, do you have a unique solution. So that means that if you have a causal function through your Matsubara points, you always have that additional freedom that you can adjust in order to get a different type of analytic continuation. And in our case, we use that additional neman linear function of freedom in order to impose additional uh, constraints. Uh, those constraints are uh, imposed in a function space. And in this case, it's a Hardy function space, but other choices are possible. Where we're essentially saying that we're not interested in just one interpolant. We're actually interested in the interpolant that also minimizes this additional norm. And this is a norm that now has the second derivatives in here, basically what that norm does is it simply it uh, enforces that our functions stay properly normalized and that they have as few wiggles as possible. And so that's very much reminiscent of what I showed you with the maximum entropy sort of penalty for having uh, you know, lots of oscillations. Uh, here you have a really a penalty that just uh, makes your function pick that one function that is the smoothest function amongst all the functions that you might possibly have. And so with this, I will come um, to some results. Uh, and I'll start very simple. These are synthetic systems. Essentially what we did here is we started with a spectral function that sort of looks like spectral functions that we would like to model. And we simply started on the real axis with these spectral functions. You see here a broad and delta pole, a simple Gaussian, a typical double Gaussian scenario, which is a little bit off-centered where you have something happening here on the positive frequency and something on the negative frequency. And then you have here a peak after peak scenario as sort of the, the type of thing that you would never ever, ever be able to get from a typical maximum entropy continuation. And so simply we evaluated then, or we back continued then this data onto the uh, imaginary axis. We forgot about all, all about the input black data and we simply ran the neman linear continuation and you see the results in blue. Uh, it's the blue one with wiggles over here. So you can see here that the interpolated data sort of gets the broad features more or less right. You know, it's probably a peak here, but it has a lot of artificial oscillations on top of that. But it is a perfectly legal interpolant. It's just one of very many interpolants that are out there. The same over here, you see that double peak structure that lower peak is now washed out with lots of these oscillations. And just the same over here, the overall peak after peak scenario is here, but we get very many spurious peaks in addition. 
Now, using that additional freedom that the Shure algorithm gives us to characterize all possible interpolant and picking the smoothest one of our interpolations, we can find here in red the final data. And actually, the blue curve for the delta peak is underneath the red curve. So here we had a very sharp feature. We went in with a smoothing algorithm, and the smoothing algorithm told us, hey, sorry, this sharp feature is actually there, and we cannot broaden it. And we're getting the delta peak right back. Here, starting from all of these oscillations, we can see that, yeah, there is there is a solution that has these oscillations, but there's also a solution that is just perfectly smooth over here. Uh, and here we're getting the double peak smoothness back and just the same over there, right? So this is now a case where uh, having all possible interpolants characterized as a free function and then using that free functions to optimize really helped us get you know, the function back that we would actually uh, expect. All right, now, uh, what is that Hardy function contribution or that helps us smooth these things? Um, here you see that uh, it's just a symmetrical double peak scenario. And if we do an expansion of the free neman linear function into five basis function coefficients, um, we see something that still has quite a few wiggles, but it's sort of smooth as it mouth, especially near zero. Now, knowing the exact closed form solution of this problem, we can actually check what the Hardy function would be that is exact, and it's the red and the pink line here. Those are our target functions. And now, just using the Hardy function optimization, we're actually getting green and blue. So this is a function that smooths away the wiggles, um, you know, sort of okay near zero, but it's totally not okay out here. And then as we increase the number of these basis function coefficients, we're able to resolve that Hardy function more and more accurately. You can see over a large interval here, it actually does match with the uh, known analytic solution. And where it doesn't match, we get a little bit of uh, you know, oscillations uh, right back. As we then keep adding basis function coefficient, eventually our minimizer will get stuck. Here is such a case where we're starting to run into trouble. You can see that here, you know, we didn't actually manage to smooth out as much as we had previously, simply because this is a nonlinear optimization problem. You know, those things have sometimes um, problems. Anyway, with that, we actually now have a fairly powerful um, toolkit. And I, I don't want to go over the top here, which is effects of like number of points and temperature. But I want to show you here what happens when we look at stochastic data that, that now does not satisfy the pick criteria. And basically, on the left, you see data that we have known analytically. It's the same data as on the la last slide. But we have perturbed the data on the Matsubara axis with stochastic noise on the level of 10 to the minus 4 and on the level of 10 to the minus six. So 10 to the minus four would be a typical Monte Carlo noise. 10 to the minus six would be a very, very clean simulation. And you can see that the failure modes are actually very similar to what you would expect from say, Pade interpolation. Um, you actually find that every now and then it just mysteriously makes sense. And this is the case in the red and the pink curve. And every now and then what you're getting is complete nonsense. That is the green and the blue one. As you then tune up or tune down your noise and you have much more precise data over here, uh, it's not that you gradually get better and better continuations. No, what happens is just that your catastrophic failure occurs less and less. And in this case, we actually have four realization uh, of random noise that uh, you know sort of managed to get the right uh, spectral function um, here. Now, I want to show you now how we apply this to uh, real materials calculation. In this case, GW formulated on the imaginary axis. And this is our problem as we started out at the beginning of the pandemic. Again, you see sort of bands somewhere here and you see sort of an indirect band gap. But other than that, most of it is just, you know, lost in the mists up here and down here. This over here is exactly the same input data to the Matsubara continuation. So on the Matsubara axis, these are one-to-one -one the same data. But now we continued it by imposing a rational function interpolation with strictly causal properties. And you can see that indeed our band gap is exactly where it should be. But in addition to that, we now have clear band structures the same way that you would expect them from any sort of real materials calculation, you know, density functional calculation or whatever. Uh, you can see the degeneracies here very clearly. Uh, you see how they split and how they come together again. Now, note that 
the fact that this Kirk fear is twice as high as over here is actually an outcome of the analytic continuation that really finds exactly the right frequency for these things. And I wanna emphasize here that there is no real frequency knowledge in this calculation. This is just a pure Matsubara calculation that we have uh, where we have done a continuation from the Matsubara axis onto the real axis using these complex analysis uh, toolkits. All right, so that's quite a game changer. Uh, and with that, I sort of show you that this actually works for you know, clean data on the imaginary axis. And I wanna go back to uh, um, you know, complex analysis and back to the early part of the 20th century, in this case, actually to 1907, when this uh, handsome guy over here, this was Konstantin Karathiodori, uh, professor uh, of analysis in Munich, was working on functions, on matrix valued complex functions that had a positive real part on the upper half of the complex plane, or in his case, on the unit circle, uh, which of course is directly related to functions like Green's functions uh, on the, on the uh, upper half of the complex plane. So uh, the precise definition is over here. The uh, consequence is that these are positive semi-definite matrices anywhere on the upper half of the complex plane. And if we go through the same mathematics as before, and I don't want to do that, then we find that all of the objects that we're used to in standard equilibrium many-body theory are actually Kara Theodori matrix-valued functions. So for example, you know, up to factors of i, minus ig lesser is a Kara Theodori function. Ig greater is Kara Theodori. Ig of i omega n is Kara Theodori. The self energy, once you subtract the Hartree term, is Kara Theodori, just the same as the Green's function. The so called cumulant, which is essentially the Green's function minus the Fock matrix, so only the self energy contribution in the Green's function, that is a Kara Theodori uh, matrix valued function. So a lot of the functions that we typically work with in many-body theory are Kara Theodori functions. And um, you know, just the same way as we could do it with neven linear functions, we can now generalize this framework to matrix-valued functions and look at the conformal ma uh, mapping of these points from the upper half of the complex plane to the inside of the unit disk. We then can evaluate uh, fitting functions through that using a matrix generalization of the Schur algorithm, evaluate it on the boundary, that's the complex unit circle here, or just the real axis over there. And just as before, there is a correspondence between uh, Karathiodori functions and contractive matrix valued Schur functions. And you see the mapping uh, over here between the two. Just as before, there is a pick criterion. The pick criterion actually turns out to be linear over here. Um, that pick my uh, criterion tells you that if you have a set of matrix valued Green's functions, you can now check whether a positive semi-definite interpolant exists uh, on, or a positive semi-definite representation of your data exists anywhere on the up, or everywhere on the upper half of the complex plane. And using the Schur algorithm, you can construct that interpolant. Just as before, we can see that this is a very restrictive criterion. And if you just take a, a bunch of random points, you're never going to find a positive uh, interpolant that satisfies the, the, the properties of a proper Green's function. Now, let's look at a couple of examples and let's see how we can get more physics out of that math. Uh, basically, what you see here is the Hubbard dimer. The Hubbard dimer is just a Hubbard model on a two side lattice. You have one over here, you have another one over there. Uh, you have a simple on-site interaction U if that dimer is doubly occupied, either over here or over there. And then you have a hopping between the two sides that just transfers electrons. And of course, this is a system that we know perfectly and we can just simply diagonalize it. And what we're getting is a bunch of delta poles here for our Green's functions. You see that over here. This is a diagonal element of the Green's function. In this case, as I said, just delta poles. And of course, if we look at the real part, that's just the Kramer's chronic transform of the imaginary part, you can see that the real part, whenever you have a pole here on, on the, in the imaginary part, uh, you're gonna get you know, a jump in the real part uh, that changes the sign. That is the technology that we had before. And you see it repeated here for the self-energy and the cumulants. Um, over here, 
um, you see the same now repeated for an off diagonal element of the Green's function. Now remember, the off diagonal elements of the Green's functions do not have to be positive. They can be positive or negative as long as the entire matrix stays positive semi-definite everywhere on the upper half of the complex plane. And you know, indeed, you find elements that are positive and elements that are negative. Again, in blue, you see our interpolant. In, in red, uh, sorry, in black, you see the actual exact data. And you can see that we are exactly getting back not just the pole positions, but also the pole strengths of those individual excitations. And again, these are the Karma's chronic transforms. And you can do exactly the same on the level of the self energies and on the level of the uh, equivalents. So um, does it actually work in practice? Well, one of the best tests we can do is we can take our Matsubara data and just scramble it with a random unitary basis transform. Now, of course, you know, if you now work to uh, continue the diagonals, you would get the total local spectral function. You see that here is just a bunch of delta peaks. But what you see here is a Theodoric, a matrix valued Theodoric continuation of the original problem. And one of the problems scrambled in a randomly rotated unitary basis. And you can see that a, the, uh, you know, the product of these or the comparison of these gives you back exactly the same uh, uh, total spectral function, which it should because the total spectral function is uh, basis independent. And it really has to be because intrinsically the Carathéodory formalism is built on the fact that all of these continuations have to be positive semi-definite in any basis that um, you're choosing. Uh, but it gets better to that. And that's the real doozy here. Um, when we're typically doing calculations, and I mentioned this at the beginning, uh, we're trying to stay on the level of Matsubara calculations. Uh, basically, we get Matsubara Green's functions. From those, we get uh, self-energies or cumulants. Then we iterate self-consistencies, do all sorts of things. And at the very end, as a post-processing step, we continue our data from the Matsubara axis uh, back to the real axis. Now, we can do that on the level of the Green's functions. Um, and that gives us the diagonal parts that we need for things like uh, you know, band structures. We can also do it on the level of the self-energies or on the level of the cumulants. Um, in fact, for diagonal elements of the self-energies, we could even do that before. But if we then want to run equations like the Dyson equation uh, that contain inversions, then of course we need to know about the off-diagonal elements of these objects on the real axis in order to be able to run uh, these Dyson equations on the real axis. And what you see up here is then with the Carathéodory formalism, we are now able to take the Green's function, compute the self-energy, analytically continue the self-energy, and run the Dyson equation on the real axis, and you see no difference in the spectral functions that we're extracting from the direct continuation and a continuation of the self-energy, or over here, a continuation of the cumulant. Again, the cumulant is essentially the Green's function minus the non-interacting part. And that is really a new capability because it now allows us to have access to these off-diagonal elements and do all sorts of interesting you know, calculations with those off-diagonal elements. And they were just previously not accessible from any sort of mini-body calculation. Um, down here, you know, you see numerical noise kick in again. That numerical noise actually comes from an overlap matrix that gets a little bit skewed uh, in, in this uh, calculation. And you can see that, you know, then numerical uncertainty is sort of like haywire with this uh, calculation. But basically, we now have a formalism where Green's functions can be computed from uh, self energies, cumulants, or just directly from the Green's function on the real axis. And we can interchange the solution of these equations on the real axis with the solution on the multiplier axis. And remember, this is uh, where we started. All right. So the second point that I want to revisit here is that you have to, oh, Greg, you have a question. Go ahead. I think you have to unmute yourself again. Uh, it's not arriving over here. Does anybody else hear, Greg? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, now it works, yes. Yeah, I think I need to get permission each time. Uh, I'm just a quick question about the, um, the expensiveness computationally. So which one is cheapest and how do they, how much more expensive are the ones that are not the cheapest if you're computing G in these different ways? So basically it doesn't matter. 
Doesn't um, matter. Okay. So, so in these calculations, the expensive step is coming up with your self energy. You know, typically that. You know, if you run GW or something like that, you know, computing the self energy is what costs. Okay. By the time you are here, you are free to go any which way, right? You can either compute the Green's function and continue it, or you can directly continue the self energy and, and go back. Those are post processing steps. They basically don't matter. Now. Um, it's a little bit more complex than that. By the time you have hundreds of orbitals, the uh, Carathéodory formalism becomes very, very sensitive to noise. And so we need to do this linear algebra that you can see somewhere here, right? You know, there, there are various matrix solutions and, and other stuff like that. That needs to be done in very high precision. So, you know, typically we do eight times, you know, eight double precisions. So, you know, what is this, uh, 1,024 or whatever uh, bits. And so just the, the, the solution of these equations starts to matter, but it's, you know, if the calculation itself takes two days, we're talk, still talking, you know, a couple hours for the post-processing step. Um, okay, great. Yeah, and yeah, really impressive results. Thanks. But, you know, I, I wanna, and this might be also interesting for you. That, that, that is actually really fun here. So now we can go back, now that we have the new technology, we can go back and see, what those brutal approximations to the self energy that are so common in our field actually are doing for a simple and stupid, you know, system like silicon that we just understand very, very well. And you see here the full continuation of everything. And over here, you see the result when you just simply toss out the dynamical part of the self energy. So you have the fully interacting Fock matrix, but none of the dynamical self energy. And you can see that, well, you know, the band gaps are totally wrong. The bands are a little bit skewed and, you know, they're, they're just, you know, the topology is more or less what it should be, but otherwise they're gone. Um, if you then say that you only want to look at the diagonal part of the self energy, that is also a, a sort of a very popular approximation within dynamical mean field theory. Um, basically, it's almost always what is done in, in LDA plus DMFT calculations of real materials. You can see that you know those things really do matter. So the off-diagonal parts of the self-energy are important. And it's not just that you can use the off-diagonal parts of the Fock matrix. You actually do need those elements in order to get an accurate representation of what's going on in your correlation physics. So this is important. And, and remember, this is silicon. This is not a correlated material, right? This is a simple as possible case here. All right. A couple of remarks. Uh, the first one is, and I think Greg uh, mentioned that already, right? I'm not a mathematician. Um, if you know this field and you find something, tell us how to do better. Um, we made a couple iterations over this and every time we come up with something new and it was actually really interesting. We know that there's more out there. We had a, a blast sort of, you know, reading the papers of 1920. Um, but we know that there's more out there and there may be more known to you. So, you know, if, if you ask yourself the question, why don't these guys do this or that, you know, chances are we just didn't come up with, with it. You know, we might just not know it. Um, most of the deep insights come from the 1910s through 1930s. Um, the technology has not been used in this context at all. Most of the theory actually seems to be forgotten. So there are few mathematicians uh, who, who are actually well versed in this subject. Then I showed a couple of successes, but there are questions and challenges and problems. Uh, there was this question about uh, QMC data. So uh, if we had a suitable data, a uh, suitable basis for Nevin-Lena functions, then we could do a lot. For example, we could just measure in the basis of Nevin-Lena functions. We could expand or project to Nevin-Lena functions. We could do a whole bunch of functional uh, analysis. And, and so there are so-called Herglotz uh, basis functions, um, but we're just not there yet. Uh, we don't know if this is a viable um, solution. There are plenty of stability issues that essentially come from, you know, non-expert doing the numerics here. Uh, I think this, these are problems that will be sorted out as we just go down this path. Um, you know, are there ways of avoiding this? It probably, uh, we're, we're just not there yet. Um, there are problems with data that is intrinsically non-causal. So basically this algorithm or this methodology uh, is unhappy if there does not exist a causal interpolant. You know, at that point, it's sort of game over. And sometimes the data that you have is just not good enough to have, sorry, to have that causal interpolant. 
So, uh, you know, what do we do in that case? And can we project onto the closest Neman Lina function? Again, we have ideas, but this is not uh, yet production ready. And sort of how, how can we deal with noise is the corollary of all of these problems, right? Um, how do we deal with data that just, you know, that should in principle be Neman Lina, but isn't? Um, in conclusion, right? Um, remember the getting blood from stone uh, picture that really applies to analytic continuation. If your data is not there, right? If your analytic continuation on the Matsubara axis doesn't have certain features, there's no amount of complex analysis that you can do to get those features back. And so, you know, this is the comment for graduate students. You have to be very careful with p-hacking. And by p-hacking in this context, I mean, producing plots that fiddle around with the analytic continuation until you find a plot that shows the features that your advisor expects. It is possible to do that, but it's not, uh, you know, you have to be careful to, you know, make solid statements with analytic continuations. But I also, I think I could show you that using the appropriate mathematics, we can actually obtain much more accurate continuations. And really the key to it was respecting the mathematical properties of the Green's function. So we can build in causality and we can build in moments. With that mathematics, we have new capabilities that we previously did not have. So first of all, we can actually look at off-diagonal terms of the Green's functions and that just previously wasn't possible. Uh, we can intrinsically guarantee that our Green's functions are positive semi-definite and basis independent and you know, all of these things. Uh, we can continue self energies. And if we actually do the cumulants and the self, uh, self energies, then we do get information to, you know, enough information or enough precision to run uh, equations on the real axis. So in conclusion, complex analysis is actually a fun theory and it's very, very powerful. And I would like to thank in particular Jenny Fay, who did most of this work in the middle of the pandemic with absolutely no face-to-face -face interaction stuck in her room. And Chanan, who's actually on the call here, uh, who's my graduate student who did all of the real materials uh, stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. That was a wonderful talk. Um, so yeah, if you want to talk, I guess there's an issue with the unmuting. So just raise your hand and I will allow you to unmute. All right, so let's see. I think you actually answered a lot of my questions I had related to um, Monte Carlo simulations. Um, so I really don't have a lot of questions. Uh, so I guess if there are no questions- um, I mean, Maybe I, I can ask one more question. Yeah, sure, of course. So, uh, you know, there are functions uh, there were formulas um, for getting topological invariance from the Green's function, uh, which involve the frequency dependence of the self energy. You know, now that you have much more accurate off diagonal terms, do you know if that would change the utility of those formulas for any, uh, you know, any real materials? I don't know if you thought along that direction or not. I, I'm, I'm actually not familiar with topological properties at all. So it, that's an interesting question. We should look into that. Um, I mean, for these calculations, we now really have very precise uh, continuations, right? And, and just imposing uh, the off-diagonal structure, the, the positive semi-definiteness of all of these things just restricts the, uh, the calculations a lot. So we should look into that if you're interested. I think it would be interesting to run you know, yeah. a few materials and, and just see if, if, this, uh, if anything useful comes out. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, we can um, talk um, offline after the talk, but yeah, I can yeah, send you some references and we can discuss. Okay. Sure, and I see a race question here. Uh, but yeah, uh, oh, good. Um, so you mentioned, uh, of course, an extraordinarily high precision that is going into these calculations. Uh, and I suppose, Historically, when people were using just regular PADE approximants, they also they, they found better results going to higher and higher precision. Uh, and so I'm wondering if you had any comparisons like with the same precision of your technique against like quote unquote regular PADE uh, um, results. 
All right, and so so I can I can tell tell you our metric in both of these cases. Uh, it, you know, basic, basically we only accept the result if it's converged with precision. So uh, what you see when you're running Pate or when you're running Nemanlina and you're using too little precision and then you repeat the calculation you know, with twice as many digits or whatever, then you see that the results change and you just keep increasing the precision until your results stop changing at both in Pate and in Nemanlina. Now for the diagonal continuation, I think that the you know, number of digits that you need for both of these are, are sort of comparable. And you know, basically both of these are continued fraction expansions. So you know, that, that it's not surprising that you have the same instability problems as with Pede. Uh, I don't think they're worse than that. For the off diagonal calculations, they're actually quite a bit worse. And you know, the basic, uh, the basic limitation there is you just have very many more elements. So if you have, uh, you know, twenty six orbitals in silicon for you know, so sort of very simple calculations, then you know every single data point that you plug in is a twenty six by twenty six matrix. Every single operation is a matrix inversion of a or you know a linear equation solution of a twenty six by twenty six matrix uh, problem, right? So these things get expensive just because of prefactors. Okay, any other questions? Just raise your hands and I will unmute you. Well, I see something else. Uh, Adam. Oh, that might have been Adam. Sorry. Yep. Okay. Good. All right. Well, I'd say that that was a good talk. So, um, I don't know if there's any announcements to make about next week's uh, thing, but yeah, uh, thank you so much, Manuel, for your talk and um, look forward to maybe discussing with you in the future. Thanks for having me. Uh-huh. All right.